All right, looks like we are live. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to I Want to See Online's first online programming day. We're super duper excited to have all of our viewers out here. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Hi, Joey here joining us today. And my name is Miss Lauren, and we're just going to be setting up our tablet here really quickly so that we can actually see your questions. So, Joni, if you want to get that event online. So, this is our first event, so we are testing a couple of things out still. Uh, this is a very exciting time for us. Would it be on the chat? Mm -hmm. Nope. Oh, so, it'll just take a moment. So, Joni, you're... Joni, this is her first Facebook Live event, so can you go back to the main Facebook page for ONC Online? And is this? Nope. So make your video small as I can. Hey Sarah, could you come over in the meantime so I can watch it on your screen? Miss Sarah is also in the background. She's another one of our teacher naturalists. Yeah. Uh, no, that would just be live. So, I'm just going to pop over here and see if we have any viewers yet because I can't see our thing. Oh, we do have some live viewers. We Sorry, guys. We have some live viewers. This is exciting. We're just getting things going. Okay. Here's our okay. Awesome. Okay. All right. So, we've got this started. And now I think we are ready to start answering some of those questions that you guys asked us over the past week or so. Again, we're very excited to have you guys out here today. So one of the first questions that we were asked was, what is ONSC and what do we do? And a little bit about ONSC is we are a nonprofit organization and our mission statement is to enhance the understanding, appreciation, and stewardship of the Ozark natural environment. So what that looks like is a lot of times we will have groups of students, usually around the fifth grade level, but anywhere from third grade up to college level and adult groups as well. We bring them out on our trail. We show them all the amazing wildlife and trees and rocks around them, and it helps them get to know nature in a way that is a lot more in-depth than they normally would otherwise. And then from there, we gain that appreciation, that love, that gratitude for the amazing planet and the amazing environment that we live in. And then from there, they're able to take what they've learned and that love that they have, and they're able to go out and help protect it. And for a lot of our viewers today, ONSC, you know, we're in the Ozark. But for anybody that lives in Rogers or Fayetteville or Springdale, Bentonville, a lot of those areas right in that corridor of North North Arkansas, you guys also live in the Ozark. So what you're seeing here at ONSC is the things that you can actually find in your own backyard as well. So we really want to connect people to nature, and that's one of our big goals. So, I don't see any new questions popping up just yet, but in the meantime, we have a couple more questions that people have asked us. Uh, one of the big questions we've been getting a lot this week, both from our staff members and also from the general public on our Facebook page, is if ONSC currently open. And with the coronavirus, we are, our doors are closed, but our trails are open. So we have about eight miles of hiking trails that you can come out and hike on. We are about an hour away from Fayetteville or Rogers off of Highway 23. And we have parking just in front of our gate. So our gate is currently closed most of the time, but you can always park just beyond the gate, hike on in, and come check out our trails. We've got a lot of amazing things to discover out here. It's springtime, so everything is just waking up. There's a lot of really, really beautiful things out here that we'll be probably talking about in just a little while. But this is a great way to practice social distancing and get out and explore 
Just a couple of things to know if you're going to be coming out here though is we are foot traffic only. So we ask you guys to leave your bikes and horses at home. Uh, we know like I love horses, I love riding my bike, but I try to keep them in places where they'll be a little bit less harmful to the, the more pristine trail. And then also we ask you guys to leave pets at home. So I'm sure Fido and Spot would love to come out here and walk with us as well. But we do ask that animals stay at home. Again, it just helps protect our native wildlife and it helps keep our trails a little bit nicer so that people can continue to enjoy them for a long time as well. Dr. Jim, is there anything you would like to add about ONSC? Well, I think you've pretty much covered things. I'd say that the big way we're open now is we're just reaching out to you online. And so even though we're, we're, we're physically separated, spiritually, emotionally, we're not separated because we can share our ideas and our thoughts via online. And that's one of the most amazing things about the age of technology is it allows us to connect even across thousands of miles. You know, I'm sure we have some visitors that are watching even now from other parts of the world. I see we have about nine people online right now. No idea where you, all of you guys are from. Where are people from out here today? We'd love to hear about it. As of right now, I see we do have a short delay on our video. So any comments that you guys might post might come up a little bit late for us, but we will address them as we see them. So, the next question that we got this week was, what are some of the things that the ONSC Future Naturalists have seen in the wild this week? Dr. Joni, you live kind of close to the phase, so you're a little bit outside of the ONSC area, so you're probably seeing a lot of the things that more of our viewers might be seeing. What have you seen out there this week? This has been pretty exciting for me, that just driving here, I saw affiliated woodpeckers, and I've been hearing this, so the Pileated Woodpecker is the largest woodpecker we have here in Northwest Arkansas. It's a very exciting bird. It's, it's long, it sort of sails across the sky. It has a long neck and a crest, and it's just incredible and beautiful. And I believe they're, they're doing their courtship now. Oh, how exciting. That's pretty thrilling. And uh, yesterday I heard a mysterious bird in the evening. And I went out to try to find it. And I did not succeed in finding that bird by the time I got out there, which was at dusk. It had quieted down. But I started fishing, and what should come in but a bunch of cedar waxwood. So oh, that's, 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 that's something that, uh, you know, a lot of times they're here more, more in winter, but they're still around. And sometimes they nest right there at Lake Fayetteville. And the, the other bird that I saw was a morning dove. Oh, uh, I love morning doves. They're just common birds. Now, Dr. Jody, you mentioned a minute or so ago about fishing. I know a lot of our natural audience probably knows what that is, but that is a skill that a lot of people might not know. Do you want to explain what that is for us a little bit? I would love to do that. And this is something you can try even in your own backyard. If, if you hear birds, you have to hold very still, and then you make the sound. And there's every, every naturalist, every birder has their own technique. What I tend to do is go slightly down the scale, so I go And just do it for a little bit and listen, and then repeat. And sometimes it takes patience. And if you're lucky, you might get a titmouse, which is a little tiny bird with its top down and top of its head, a tuft of titmouse, or a chickadee. They're two of the birds that come to bird feeders, but they also are very responsive to fishing. And if you can get one of them scolding you, then sometimes a lot of birds will come in and join the ruckus, and so you get to see a lot of different birds. And, and that's always very, very exciting, and it's a fun thing for you to try. I, I highly recommend you try that. Yeah, I've had a lot of success with fishing as well, even just out here on the trails. Earlier this week, I managed to pitch in a couple of really cool birds. I actually, I got to see my first black and white warbler of the season this week. They're really fun. They're one of my favorite springtime birds. They're one of the first birds that migrate up here every spring. And they're a little tiny bird, just a few inches long. And they kind of have this zebra crab pattern to them. They're really, really exciting birds. And their call kind of sounds like a squeaky wheelbarrow. It's like, ee 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 ee
All right, that for me is a pure sign that spring is on the way. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. I love our spring birds. I agree with that, and it is exciting. It's so thrilling that the trees are greening out and, and flowers are budding out, and this is my favorite time of the year, and it, it just feels so good and so alive. And, and I hope that somehow, if you have a chance to get a chance to get out, even if it's just in your own backyard, just to feel how nice it is outdoors. Oh yeah, I was definitely feeling it yesterday when the temperature was 85 degrees. Oh, thank you, Paige, for your comment that it's a little bit echoey. We can try, we're still working on getting this all set up and ready to go. So we will be adjusting our volume. We have another plan that we're going to try for next week. Um, but in the meantime, please bear with us. Uh, we might even try, Dr. Yoni, if we turn our voices down just a little bit. Uh, and then we can also test out our microphone again, which I have right over there. That sounds good. I can, I've been sitting to project my voice, and I'll, I'll try to talk to you normally. And I wanted to say something else that was an exciting thing for me uh, to, on a warm day, which we've got our broccoli planted. So that's something I went out and did and with my husband, and we, we got some broccoli planted, and I'm very excited about that, and it was so nice outside. It just felt really good to feel that sunshine on. Yeah, this is a, I love it. This is one of my favorite times of year because I get to start planting in my garden as well. And so pretty soon I'm going to be starting all of my culinary errors. So Dr. Joni and I have known each other for a couple of years. She knows that one of my favorite things to do is to grow lots and lots of plants. So a couple of years ago I had over 100 basil plants that I started with little tiny seeds. And I was able to give them out to a lot of members of my community. And it was really exciting to form that connection of having this little tiny plant that I started just as a seed and seeing it grow into this thing that was full of life and being able to pass that on to somebody else to then mentor it. And that's one of the big reasons why I'm out here as well is to spread the joy that I feel being outside in nature with the people around me. And Lauren, thank you because you shared that day. those days of plants with me too. And I had those that I put them into larger pots and they were in our garden all year long and they grew so big and so beautiful and they were very satisfactory. Mm -hmm. And then you gave me one with them all again. I remember that was so nice. I had gone away visiting and I came back and Josh was in and he had given me back one of my bagels that I couldn't take with me. So that was a really special thing. Um, but moving back to some of the things that we've been seeing out here this past week, I have seen a lot of our spring wildflowers are starting to pop up for the first time, and we'll be posting some of those pictures later on today. But we have some really, really pretty flowers that are starting to bloom. This week I've seen a lot of the Rambo hepatica, which is this little tiny purple flower, as well as Lover, which is really, it's larger white flowers, very, very pretty. But what I'm really excited about is a lot of our red buds and our other trees are starting to bob and bloom. I can feel the fairy myself. And mm -hmm. In Princeton, the dogs are really flowering, and, and that's one of the plants that's so beautiful. It's native to here in Arkansas. It's such a beautiful, beautiful tree that people plant it all over the country where it's warm enough for it to survive. One of my favorite trees has been blooming this week, and we're just really starting to see the flowers opening up out here at the Science Center. But I know closer to Fayetteville, the flowers have been blooming a lot over the past few days. I was in Huntsville earlier and I saw them. Um, but they are, they're those pink kind of pea-shaped flowers, and you'll see a lot of the trees on the side of the road are blooming with those tiny little pink flowers right now. And they're just so beautiful. Um, Seeing that pop of color before they start to reach out, it's just like it's a breath of fresh air after the long winter. It's the whole the whole outdoor feels like a breath of fresh air. Yeah, and, and of course we've got pear trees flowering in Fayetteville. When I drive through Fayetteville, I see lots and lots of pear trees flowering. You've probably seen them yourself if you live in Fayetteville or even outside of Fayetteville and other areas. Uh, that's one of the flowering trees and cherries are flowering too. So this is just a beautiful time of year to choose the flowers. 
Yeah, I've definitely been enjoying seeing we have some sort of wild plum tree that flowers on our property. And just the past few days when I've been stepping outside and I'm getting that overwhelming smell of just like wild berries. And so one of my favorite things about the springtime is all of the smells. Because you get the smells of the flowers and you can smell the soil as it's coming back to life and the things that's coming out of it. And it just it smells like new life. Like I feel like it's something that we all, you know, that we're all kind of looking for, especially in our city. So definitely kind of appreciating that. One more thing I really like about the um, the red buds is that if you're really gentle with those little tiny pasty shaped flowers on the tree, if you can pick a couple of them off. And if you know that they haven't had any pesticides sprayed on them or anything, you can sprinkle a few on your salad and they make a colorful little garnish. And they're pretty tasty. You do have to be a little bit gentle with them though because I've heard that if you pluck it off at the base, you can actually make it, that flower won't be in the same spot again the next year. Oh, I didn't know that. That's very good to know. But they're, you know, it's fun to go out in nature. I love using all of my senses based on what I know. Because nature is something more than just to be looked at and to be heard. Sometimes the most exciting things are getting to touch things and smell things and taste things. And springtime is definitely a good time for that. I love the description of spring, that the springtime smells like new life. Because that's exactly how I feel. It feels like life is awakening and, and it's a wonderful time. It's time to celebrate. So we should be celebrating the springtime. Yeah. And you guys can even go out into your own communities and take some time to see what you can smell. Even outside of your own front door, sometimes there's new smells and sometimes you can even smell like when a rainstorm is coming in. Take some time this week and maybe go out there and smell a little bit each day and see what the winter mean is. That could be something really fun to do if any of you guys are keeping a nature journal. It's something I like to do. It helps me kind of keep track of the seasons. It gets me excited because I'm like, oh, it's the end of March, the beginning of April. That means I'm pretty soon a lot of my favorite birds are going to be coming back. I'm going to be seeing a lot of my favorite flowers. And I know that there will be some really cool other things popping up. For example, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of our spring mushrooms. Oh, yes. The mushrooms are really thrilling. And I was going to say, in addition to what you smell, this is a good time of year for listening because the birds are singing. See how many different bird sounds you hear. And see if you can, maybe you can learn some. Like the cardinal, the red bird, the question. He has all kinds of songs. So listen to see if you can see a cardinal and hear what he's singing. And uh, the little Carolina wren is a little tiny bird with a cocktail. And she, many people say that her sound her and his are the male and the female will sing back and forth, and their song sounds their song sounds a little bit like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. And I've definitely been hearing them this morning. They were very loud. They've been singing a lot where we live too out there. So that's a good bird to listen for. And also, if you see any birds or flowers, if you don't know what it is, you can try to draw a picture of it. And you can also look online and maybe you can find out what that wildflower is or what that bird is just by looking on the line. Yeah. So, and actually that brings us really well into our last major question of the morning, which was, how can we discover what we have in our own community? And I feel like right now, especially as it's getting a little bit harder to leave our homes and to go out and explore, you know, I know a lot of state parks and various places have closed down, and all of this. people are finding it a little bit harder to find places that are open to explore. And then those places, sometimes they're too busy or crowded. And in order to stay safe, sometimes the most exciting things we can look for are right outside our own front door. So Joni, what are some things that, what are some ways that you discover what's in your own community? You mentioned looking online. If you wanted to find out what was in your own backyard, where would you start? Well, I think it would depend on what you were interested in. But one thing is, would be with yourself and just going out and seeing what you could find with yourself. But there are also online um, sites where you can find out, like on Birds for Birds, there's a bird site uh, called, well, there's different sites, but one of them is the Northwest Arkansas 
website, and you can go on there, and they'll have pictures of things and 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 links so that you can get to places to learn about different birds and where different birds are found. But another thing is our birds, and that's A R B I R D S. And you can go online and just Google that, and you can sign up for our birds, and that's an email, and that will tell you. People write in and they tell, tell all, all the people on Arbor, all the different birds they see. And that's how I find out a lot about the birds that are coming up right now. The new birds that are just starting to show up. So exciting, yeah. You can definitely use Arbor. Um, I'll also sometimes use eBird. That's a um, good one. And eBird is amazing because every day, you know, it's updated. People go out and they see what they're finding in their own community. And you can search by county which makes it really easy to tell. And this is anywhere in the country, actually anywhere in the world. Um, if you look up your country or your state or your county, you can see what people have been seeing there. And that can kind of let you know where to start. Maybe your goal is to you know, see your first northern parula after that. And northern parula is another little tiny bird uh, it's kind of blue and yellowish in color. It's very, very colorful. Um, I just thought, well, I've been hearing them the past two days now. They have like a kind of a buzzy upward sound. It's like, hmm? That's it. And so, you know, maybe that's a goal for you is to discover these birds that are already in your own community that you haven't seen. But on top of going online, sometimes the best way to discover things is just to get out there. So if you have a lawn you can explore, or even just your own street in town, if you're allowed to go outside, especially kids, make sure you check in with your parents before you go outside, um, just so that they know where you are and everything. But one of my favorite things to do when I was a little girl was to go out in my yard with a magnifying glass and pretend that I was just a couple inches tall and go through the grass and I discovered all of these amazing insects that I had never seen before beetles of every color of a rainbow, um, lots of amazing ants doing really cool things. That's and what I was thinking. Yeah, so just kind of get down, look around, um, keep your eyes and your ears open, and that can help you provide a really good start. And then if you find something and you're not sure what it is, again, you can always go online. Um, on top of eBird, another really cool resource that you can use to find out what people are going to be seeing is called iNaturalist and there are people putting up pictures and so other people can identify them. There's a lot of experts in the area that are using this not just to find out what's around them, but they actually use it for their research as well. So if you happen to find something and you're not sure what it is, you can post it and other people will identify it and they can use that both to learn what's in your own backyard, but then also to help scientists across the country. So that's one of the things that I really like to emphasize to kids when they're out here. And that's the fact that every single one of us can be a scientist. And every single one of us can contribute to this amazing research that's going on. And in the meantime, kind of learn and have some fun ourselves. And the more people contribute, the more information we have, the more we learn and the better we can test things and just have fun learning about things. And here's another idea if you want to see more. One of the things you could do is set up some bird feeders. We have bird feeders out here and that's not that hard to do. And don't they have, now they say I have things set up so that they can deliver seeds to your door. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is something that's a safe way to look at birds and look at nature. Just set, up, set them up far enough from your windows so that they don't run into the glass. Yeah, and we definitely, we've noticed that a couple times too, is you want to make sure that you're setting up your feeders a little bit farther away. You can also get, they have these little decals that you can put on your windows and it helps prevent birds from running into them. We've been really lucky that we haven't had too many of those out here, especially since one of our big things is having so many windows on site to let in all the natural light. It's one of the ways that we help protect our environment. The fewer lights we have to have on inside our building, the best. Now, one more thing, speaking of that, I do want to mention, Dr. Downey, have you heard about Earth Hour this weekend? Yes, I have. Do you want to tell people a little bit more about that? Yeah, and maybe you can fill in anything that I forget. So, Earth Hour is coming up tomorrow night.
from I believe it's 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. And it is this worldwide movement to help protect the environment by reducing our energy use. And so during that hour of time, what you do is you turn off all of your lights, um, maybe unplug all of your appliances, and just try and live an hour off the grid. And this is a really great way if you're in a community where a bunch of people participate, you can go out and look up at the stars. Right now we have some really cool constellations up. Uh, lately I've been seeing the constellation Orion a lot. And so you can always see that one by looking for the three stars that make up Orion's belt. And they're very bright in the night sky right now. Another thing that I've been seeing in the evenings is Venus. And Venus, you know, is one of our closest planetary neighbors. And you'll see that in the evening in the western sky. It's just a very bright star. So while you have all your lights off, you can go out and do some stargazing. Maybe do some storytelling uh, in the past. What I've done is we had a little fire pit. We've gone out and just done a little fire. And that can be a good way to connect with your family. I think it's a really, really valuable way to help people connect to nature and also to reduce their energy use. And then you see like, oh, I did this for an hour and I discovered, you know, this really cool thing that I didn't know about. So sometimes it can help you find ways that you can be a better steward, a better protector for the environment and not have to change your entire life to do this. And it's a way to share things with your family. You could, you could use it as a time to just get the members of the family to tell different stories or they could talk about their experiences and just whatever you want to talk about. And so it's a good time to get people to be thinking and looking and talking for, your, for yourself and without depending upon all our energies that we use so much of. Exactly. So we are jumping into about the time when we are going to be Switching up things a little bit, we are going to be doing a live stream from one of our bird feeders out here on the property. And just a little bit about what we put into our bird feeders. We have a 100% black oil sunflower seed that we put into our bird feeders. We discovered here at the Science Center that if you add other things like millet into it, uh, the birds are going to throw that on the ground. And even though those blends tend to be cheaper, they also tend to run out a lot faster and we have to go and purchase more. So we like to go with the black oil sunflower seeds. Now we also have a lot of squirrels out here, which any of our previous students might have noticed. So we do also put corn, cracked corn, along our railings. So the birds can come and pick that off. But then also the squirrels eat the corn, which is a lot cheaper than the sunflower seeds. So they fill up on corn and it makes it so just a little bit longer. Right now, today, we also have some slices of orange out on our porch, and that is to attract the Baltimore Orioles that are going to be migrating to. Um, I know other parts of the state have seen them, and we're hoping to get a couple out here soon. So they're a bright orange bird. They're almost as orange as the oranges themselves. Yes, they are. They're beautiful. They are so beautiful. And they love fruit, and so sometimes they get to see them. And I'm just really excited to see what we're going to see as birds come to the feeders. We'll tell you guys a little bit about them. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to my very technologically advanced method of switching my camera over. And by that, I mean I'm going to pick up my my camera and move it over here to one of our bird feeders. Just to give you guys a little bit of an idea, this is our dining hall. This is where students will eat throughout the year as they come on our field trips. Over there, you can see our Zero Waste Heroes Hall of Fame. So one of our big programs out here at the Science Center is we talk about food waste. And so as students come out here and they learn how to reduce their food waste as well as why it's important to reduce our food waste, their school's names go up on our Hall of Fame so that other schools that come in can see what we do as well and they can learn too. All right. So we have, I have to go. Yep, that's just, that's just the feedback from our, oh, the video 
videos. So you can see here, here is one of our bird feeders. And I'm going to see if we can zoom in. Ooh, yes, we can. So zoom in on that, and you can see we have our black oil sunflower seed, as well as our orange peel. And you can kind of see a little bit of the corn, and we'll just see who pops in for the next few minutes, just to see what we might find. Um, Sometimes it helps if we stand back from the window. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine it's a little bit easier for you guys to hear us now. Um, while we are waiting, we'll talk a little bit about some of the really cool birds that we sometimes see at our feeders and some of the things that we can do to help birds. So Dr. Joni, do you want to talk about a way that we can protect birds or some of your favorite ways to protect birds? Well, there's, there's different ways. Uh, we talked about the fact that, that the birds can sometimes run into our window glass. So there's things that you can do. They actually have bird tape uh, that you can get. Uh, the American Bird Conservancy sells, sells these, these little curtain-like things that you can put up over your windows that, that uh, aren't very vis aren't noticeable, but they discourage birds. So if you go online on, on the American Bird Conservancy, they have all kinds of ways that you can protect birds from the glass of your windows uh, and you can choose whatever you s suits you best. So that's one very good way you can help birds. Uh, something you can do to help the environment overall is have your own garden, just like I was talking about planting my garden this spring and it's so fun to do, it's so exciting and you learn so much from it and it's, it's just wonderful. But one of the things for our garden, we don't have pesticides because pesticides, well they can kill the, the harmful insects, but they also can kill the helpful insects. So we just don't use pesticides at all. And what we found is that our garden becomes filled with animals. We have all sorts of animals living there, like frogs and other kinds of animals, that birds that, that help eat the pesky insects. And so it's, it's really nice to not use the pesticides. Your garden becomes more alive without those pesticides. Oops, so we're so gonna. We had some. Plastic. Don't use straws. Straws. The plastic is causing such problems in the ocean. So that uh, try to avoid using single-use plastics. Try to use re thing, you bring a carry a bag to the grocery store. Things like that. So we just had a couple of really, really colorful birds over here at this feeder. They were some bright yellow birds. And you can actually, you can maybe see them hopping along. We might have one or two come up to the feeder. Um, and they are goldfinches. So we'll be watching for them to get Here's closer. There's one on the ground, another little bird. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can move it to show him really quickly because he's very cool. Where did he go? Okay, he's, he's right, right there. Yeah. Oh. And that little bird that we have right there, that's one of our more common spring sparrows. There's a chipping sparrow. And there's a goldfinch now in the tree back there. There's two of them. Three. So four. Hopefully the goldfinches will come in. I'm trying to get it focused on the feeder a little bit more. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and move it back up here. But Dr. Joni, do you want to tell these guys a little bit about chipping sparrows? That little blackened, and not black, but brown and gray bird that we were seeing? Well, one of the ways you can recognize a chipping sparrow is that he has, he has a little kind of rufous colored cap and he has a line through the eye and they are a very friendly sparrow. They, you often see them at parks and they come to feeders and they are a great bird to respond to pishing. Once we had uh, out here I had a group of, of children and they were all pitching to call in a chipping sparrow and it let us come to within maybe five feet of it. So that's a very good bird to make friends with. Yeah, they are very friendly little birds. And while we were talking, I saw we had a goldfinch come up to the feeder. Here, here's oh, one right now. There's one now. We have, the males have just barely started getting that bright yellow color that we can see. So you can see that they are 
a golden yellow and they've got that kind of black marking on their forehead. The females are a lot duller in color. They're kind of an olive colored bird. So throughout most of the winter time, they'll all be kind of paler in color. But right now we have quite a few goldfinches coming. We've got, there's at least two males and I think there's a female on the back side as well. I see several in the trees back there. So, there they go. And they're they do still like in to, there. And they like to hang out in large numbers. Oh, we have a female cardinal that just flew onto the back. And, and you can recognize those female cardinals. Any cardinal except the very youngest have this big orange bill. So if you, if you, now right now her head's hidden, but if you get a chance, you can see that one way to be sure it's a cardinal is that orange bill. And now we have on the ground, we have another chipping sparrow. Oops, the first one chased the second one away. So bird feeders are a great way to observe bird behavior as well. So you can see here, like I said, the goldfinches like to gather in large numbers. And then we have the chipping sparrows, which don't tend to gather in as large numbers I've seen, but you can also see like how different species of birds, you know, some species are gonna be a lot more aggressive towards the others, others are gonna be more social. Some birds like to sit in the same spot for a really long time and eat, whereas others will just come along, grab a seed and go. And so we can see a little bit of that going on right here. I see back beyond our feeders right now, we do have a chipping sparrow in the trees and so we're hoping maybe he'll come a little bit closer. Sometimes they like to hang out on the railing. We'll hope that one of them comes along as well. But one seems to, wants to come here, but it's not quite comfortable. Yeah, I think she's also she was looking for a good spot, and they were. I taken. think yeah, I think the boys had taken all of her favorite spots that she wanted. One of the things that one of our teacher naturalists saw this morning, actually, Dr. Joni was she saw a an eastern phoebe which is one of our really right. common birds out here and we've been watching them the, over the past couple of weeks or so they've been starting to build their nests mm -hmm. already i've noticed that myself and so she saw one with nesting material in her beak heading towards her nest well, that's great so it's really fun to see what birds are using what materials to build their nests and this is definitely getting to be the time of year when a lot of these birds are going to be dividing their time and energy between finding food and building their nests. Mm -hmm. And when you hear the male birds singing, they're doing two things. One, they're warning the other males, keep away, this is my home, keep away. But they're also calling the females and saying, here I am, here I am. And as I said, the Carolina wrens, the males and the females sing, and they sing a little song back and forth, and that helps them to bond and become closer to each other, but it also warns away all the other finches from their area. I so, see a bird down there lower. Is that I him? think it's a goldfinch. I thought it was too. So yeah, there's a goldfinch that's kind of hanging on to one of the railings. I don't know how much you guys can see of that, but she's hanging on on the bottom. Now more female goldfinches seem to be showing up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with a lot of birds, the males seem to show up before the females. I've noticed that even in migration. So, oh yeah. Like for example, one of the birds that's starting to move its way up through Arkansas right now is hummingbirds, and they'll be showing up in large numbers pretty soon. So, this will definitely be a good time to get your hummingbird feeders out if you love watching them. I know they're one of my favorite birds. They're so tiny, but they have such a spirited personality. But and the males will come up a couple weeks before the females. Yes. And that's that's true. This is ideas people have about that. They think, number one, the males maybe don't go as far south. And number two, they may be heading up north before the females because they have a job to do. They need to get their territory all ready so that when the female comes, they have a nice place where she can be attracted to them and mate with them. So the female, the male's job is to kind of get the territory set up. How exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just amazed at how much these little tiny birds are able to travel. Like a lot of the birds that migrate up, they're coming from the Caribbean or Central or South America. And, you know, these birds are just a few inches long and they're traveling thousands of miles. Like if I want to travel that far, I would hop on an airplane. And, and you know something, these birds are actually 
energy efficient because they save energy by waiting till the wind is going in the right direction and that makes it a lot easier for them. If, the, if they're trying to head north, they wait till the wind is blowing north and that helps carry them up. And one of the things uh, that's exciting for us humans, but it's not so good for the birds, is sometimes when bad weather comes, those birds get blown off course and that's when you might see some really unusual rare bird in your area. So that's always very exciting for us, but of course for the little bird, it means that it's out of its way and it, it will have to make its way back home again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there have been some really unusual birds seen in Arkansas over the past year, just in various places. That's true. So that can be, if you notice a bird and you, you know, you're used to seeing one kind of bird and all of a sudden you see a different bird and you're not sure what it is, and you look it up and it turns out to be something that is really uncommon, it's a really good thing to share that with places like our bird uh, or eBird mm -hmm. so that scientists can know that that bird has found its way there because a lot of birds, it's really hard to keep records of them. Even some birds that might be more common but are just more secretive. For example, out here at the Science Center, uh, we have a researcher who is coming out and doing research on our northern Sawat owls that spend the winter. So that's Mitchell Pruitt and he is amazing. But he came out here and he started finding these owls and up until his research there were very, very few sightings of this owl. I think fewer than 10 yeah. in the entire state. And now, you know, in one season he's discovered more than that many owls just on our site. So Sometimes it can be really cool to find those those less common or those less commonly seen species. And that's something that, you know, we're still discovering. That's something you could discover in your own neighborhood. So definitely important to keep your eyes and ears open. Um, while we've been talking, there was another chipping sparrow that came kind of closer to the orange. He was eating the corn. He was really awesome. Something else I noticed flying overhead, and you guys wouldn't have been able to see it, but I saw a turkey vulture. Mm -hmm. And turkey vultures are one of my favorite birds because they just have so many unique characteristics about them. Yeah. And one way you can recognize a turkey vulture in the sky is they're a very large bird and their wings form a V. And they kind of teeter-totter back and forth. And so if you see a bird like that, then that is probably going to be a turkey vulture. Mm -hmm. Almost, it's got to be. Now, one of my favorite things about turkey vultures is the fact that they're kind of lazy birds, and I can relate to that sometimes, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, but what they'll do is they will glide, so they'll hold their wings out, and they'll let the air currents take them where they need to go. And when you see a bunch of vultures circling overhead, a lot of people think it's because they found something dead on the ground, or that it's, you know, some sign that, that something's about to die. And that's not usually the case. It's actually something called kettling. And it's just the birds are riding those warmer air currents up into the higher atmosphere. So anybody that has maybe seen our webpage and has been following along with some of our activities that have been posted, you might have seen a little bit about why wind blows. As that warm air gets warmer, it kind of drifts higher up into the atmosphere where it cools off, it's able to bring itself back down. And the turkey vultures will ride their, those currents so that they don't have to work as hard. It's like an elevator for birds. Mm -hmm. Now, turkey vultures, they're a lot bigger in real life than they look sometimes when they're up in the sky. Their wingspan is about six feet, so that's the same height as you know, a lot of adult humans. And they're able to fly for a really long time without flapping their wings. If humans had wings that would allow us to act the same way turkey vultures do, our wingspan would be like 40 feet. Oh, did you see that yes, right there? I in the saw feeder? that. A male bird was feeding a female. Oh, how cute. Isn't that exciting? Yep. So, yeah, these guys, you know, they're starting to, to pair up and to figure out what's going on for the year. It's kind of like, I like to think of bird feeders as kind of like a dating app for birds, it's, too. Yeah, it's a socializing. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like a bar for birds. <laughs> So they all hang out and they get to know each other and you know sometimes it's also families that come mm -hmm. and sometimes you can even see the same bird year after year. Right. 
Two and, years. Oh, go ahead. Two years ago when I started out here, I saw a really exciting bird at one of our bird feeders. It was a blue grosbeak, and these are a rather oh, large right. blue bird with a really big beak. And I told Dr. Joni, and she didn't believe me at first. <laughs> She's like, no, it must be this other bird, an indigo bunting, which is a smaller bluebird, which I think they'll be showing up pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they will be. They will. And so she's like, I've never seen one of those out here before. And now that same bird has come back for two years, and we're hoping to yeah. see him again. Yeah. Um, but so far, he's the only one I've seen. I haven't seen any females. But... You know, if he hangs out here long enough, maybe he'll find a lady friend out here and teach her. And then maybe we'll see them bringing their fledglings to our bird feeders as well, which would be a really exciting thing. And one reason we don't have a lot of blue grosbeaks out here is because they like a more open area. And ONSC is surrounded by forests. But if you go into farmland areas, uh, that's where you can see blue grosbeaks. And I've definitely seen them at Lake Fayetteville and other areas, other wild areas around uh, the Ozarks. So there's a lot of there's a lot of really cool birds and the birds that we're seeing a lot of them are woodland birds but like goldfinches you can definitely see in your backyards the chipping sparrows you can see in their backyards I'm really surprised we haven't had a cardinal come to this feeder yet well we had the female we had the female and I've been seeing males at we have a couple other feeders but they've been they've been kind of coming and going quickly this morning I've been seeing them while we were talking earlier I did see some cardinals. Uh, coming up to the feeders, but one thing I wanted to say also is that in a few, in a, maybe a month or so, coming to the feeders will be, the parent birds will be bringing their baby birds, and I've seen that especially with house finches, where the parent bird will show the little baby, the youngster, and the youngster, you can't tell very well that it's a baby, it doesn't look tiny at this point, it can already fly, but, and then the youngsters will show them the bird feeders, and they will actually feed them at the bird feeders. So that's something that can happen by the time you have to allow time for the birds to build their nest, raise their babies. So say in a month or two, a month or two that's when you should start seeing the parent birds bringing their babies to the feeders. And that's just so cute. I love watching it. I remember when I lived in a place where we had a bird feeder outside my window and there were a couple of cardinals that had their nest like literally right outside my window. And it was so cute watching those little baby cardinals grow up and seeing them oh, get yeah. a little bigger each day. And the same thing is true for our Phoebes. Um, and we're thinking sometime in the future, one of these weeks, we're going to have a Phoebe nest cam up. So instead of watching our bird feeders here, we'll actually have a live stream on that nest so that we can watch the Phoebes come and go as they're bringing food to their babies. That would be really exciting. And Phoebes are one of my favorite birds. I hear them a lot out here, and you probably hear them a lot in town, oh, yes, too. Yes. They're a really easy bird to identify because they kind of sound like they're saying, Phoebe, Phoebe. Yeah, they say, they say it over and over and over again. I think about it like if there were, if there were real-life Pokemon, I feel like a Phoebe would be a great example of it because they say their own name. Right. So, And they're very, very loud. They start singing pretty early in the morning. So they're a really great bird to be looking out for in your own communities. And, and they okay. like to nest on the side of buildings too. So you might even have a bird's nest on the side of your house and not know it. The Carolina wrens are kind of the same way. They'll nest just about just about anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so you can hear them because they have that really loud tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. I know this morning the, uh, the Carolina wrens and the Phoebes were the first birds to wake me up. And it was very early this morning, it was probably sometime between 6 and 6.30 that I was hearing this chorus of birds. Mm -hmm. And again, like the early, early mornings when all the birds are calling to each other is a really great time to just get up and sit outside, maybe, maybe eat your bowl of cereal outside and just listen to the songs of nature. Especially right now as there's fewer cars on the road, this is going to be a great time to really hear the sounds that you'll be able to there, that you would normally be able to hear, but just there's so much technology going on around us that we miss out on it. So that's an opportunity that we have now that we don't always have. Yeah. So I, some oh, sometimes ahead. there's you know sometimes there's some some benefits even in the darkest times. Yeah. And I was going to say you talked about the Carolina wrens building their nests in strange places. And one year we actually had one build her nest in our mailbox 
And so we had to separate, set up a separate mailbox so that we could leave the rent alone, and she raised her babies right there in the mailbox. So they like like a little a little cave almost, a little nook to, to build their nest in. They're very, very, they're very cute birds. I like them a lot. Waiting to see if we have anybody else coming in. Do you have any any bird that you're especially looking forward to seeing this spring? Hmm, that's a tough question. I mean, a lot of the birds that I really like to see, I'd have to travel a little bit more to see this year. So I think I'm more excited to just see a lot of the birds that are out here at the Science Center um, that maybe I didn't know were out here. So rather than going and exploring a larger area, I'm excited to spend a lot of my time a little bit closer to home and to really get to know my bird neighbors. But if I had to choose just one, ooh, that's a tough one. Hmm. I would say I'm really excited to have our scarlet and summer tanagers oh, come back. Those. And they're both, they're beautiful, bright red birds. Um, the, sar or the scarlet tanagers. They're more like deep woods birds, and they have black on their wings. And the summer tanagers are just a beautiful bright red bird, um, about the same color as a cardinal, but without that kind of mohawk-looking crest that they have, and with a much smaller bill. And they sing, and their songs are just so beautiful. Like, they're a beautiful bird with a beautiful song, and so I always look forward to seeing them every year. How about you, Joni? Well, I'm looking forward to the Orioles, and one of the things we do is, is when we put up our hummingbird feeders, being aware that the Orioles are also attracted to the hummingbird feeders, uh, we'll have an Oriole feeder, which is very much like a hummingbird feeder, and we also put out lots of oranges, and, and every year is different. Some years there won't be very many Orioles, and some years there will be so many Orioles. And last year, it seemed like everybody who, who looked at birds was buying oranges and cutting them up into quarters and, or into halves and setting them out because last year we had oh, many, 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 many Orioles coming. Or maybe it was the year before last. And, and it was like the world was filled with Orioles and we had so many Orioles flying back and forth and they ate the oranges and they also came to the hummingbird feeders. And so that's something I always, every spring, I hope that we have a, a lot of Orioles come and visit us. We haven't had too many out here at the Science Center the past couple of years, which, you know, it surprised me, especially hearing so many people in town talking about all the Orioles they were seeing. And, like, I noticed even when I left this area, and one of the things I think for that is the more you feed them, the more often they'll remember to come through. They'll be like, oh, this is a safe spot where I can get food on my migration path. And so... One of the things that you can do if you want to attract more birds to your yard is not just feed them, but feed them consistently. So making sure that you always have some bird feed in your feeders and feeding them every year. So I, I've heard about people that, we actually we had some visitors come out to the Science Center yesterday and I happened to talk to them for a few minutes and they said that they knew someone that had hummingbirds come by the hundreds every year and they would just have their arms, they would have, you know, gallons of hummingbird feed in their, on their feeders, on their arms, and there would just be swarms of hummingbirds coming to them. And that was because they'd been doing it for so long. And I know one of our kitchen staff members, she's been feeding the birds for years and years, so well, we might just get a couple birds here. She's just a few miles down the road and she'll get many more. She gets dozens of them, yes, Brenda. So. She gets so many. Orioles, and stuff. Mm -hmm. they're her specialty. She has lots of Orioles. So, oh, and another thing that's very good for the birds is a bird bath. Mm -hmm. So you can put a bird bath. Uh, they sell them at, at, in nearby stores. You could probably also get them delivered. And those are better to have a little bit off the ground and in a kind of open space. Oh, and that little bird that just flew, I don't know if you guys got to see him, but there was a bird at the bottom of the feeder this little gray bird is a tufted tip mouse, and they're cute. They they have a little tuft on their head. It's like a little gray mohawk, and they go Peter, 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 and they're so they're so just cute. they're very cute little birds. So we love seeing them at our feeders as well. They're here year round. <coughs> we'll see them in large numbers, and they're just very very delightful. They are. They're sweethearts. 
So let's see here. We still have a few people on here. Awesome. This is great. I'm so glad that we have some people that have stuck with us for a whole first hour. We are, we'll be out of time in just a few minutes. Um, I do want to thank you guys for watching with us and we will be doing this every Friday from 10 to 11 for at least the next few weeks. And we'll be rotating out some of our teacher naturalists. So it won't just be me and Joni every week, I promise. We'll see probably a few other people as well. And each of us kind of has our own thing that we like to talk about. But if you guys want more information about ONSC or have any other questions, comments, thoughts, please feel free to reach out to us on our Facebook page. Uh, feel free to reach out to us on our email. And feel free to, you know, even swing by the Science Center and take a walk. Like I said, this is a great way to practice that social distancing. And it's a great way to explore what's around you. So, again, feel free to step outside. But if you can't step outside, or if you're one of our viewers that's watching from farther away, again, a lot of the things that we're seeing and talking about are things that you might be able to see in your own backyard as well. This isn't, you know, we have 15,000 acres of woodlands out here, and so we have some really amazing things. But we also have things that are really common everywhere. And, oh, there's our little tufted titmouse again. Of course, he's going to hang out in the back. Oh, there we go. He's getting a couple of little seeds there. You notice that they're different than the goldfinch. The goldfinch, they come to the feeders, and they're there for a while. They just hang out there. The titmice and the chickadees... They'll come to the feeder and they'll grab a seed and then they'll go. And sometimes what they're doing is they're taking that seed and they're hiding it somewhere for later. So they plan ahead. And they, they, what that's called is catching. And they'll catch, their, they'll catch their seeds in different places. And they remember where they hide those seeds. And then they'll come back and get them later when they need it. One of my favorite things to watch is one of our birds that we have out here, a lot of them. And I've seen them a lot in town too. Uh, they're the white-breasted nuthatch, and they're those birds that you'll see them clinging to the side of a tree like a woodpecker, but they'll actually be face down, so they'll have their tail up in the air, and their beak will be pointing towards the ground. And what I'll see them do sometimes is I'll see them take a seed, they'll fly a few feet away into one of the nearby trees, and then they'll just start like shoving the seed into the holes in the bark. And that's a really easy way to see that catching behavior. Um, so it's a really, really common one. I do want to take some time at the end of this activity today just to kind of thank some of our sponsors because we're really, really lucky out here that we have such a strong community commitment. And so I want to thank places like the Walton Family Foundation, I want to thank Adventure Subaru, and I want to thank the Fayetteville Public Schools for helping us out in order to stay open and to continue to give you guys a lot of really great uh, information and to hopefully continue to do so for a really long time to come. Uh, if you guys would like to donate to the Science Center, you can find out how to donate to us on our webpage. Uh, but really, we just appreciate the fact that you guys are out here at all watching us and we appreciate the connections that we have with the community, not Look, just it's, our... It's a Phoebe. Oh, is can you get the camera on the Phoebe? She's I right try. there. Let me just move this oh, up. She just I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I was so excited yeah. to see the Phoebe there. And, yeah, we might... Oh, who is that? Oh, we have a chickadee here. There it goes. But we have a couple of birds here. I wish you guys could see it. You might have noticed it a little bit. That is one of those chickadees. It's a Carolina chickadee. Um... But the Eastern Phoebes, one of my favorite things about them is they'll fly to a spot and then they'll fly back to that same spot once they catch a bug. And so it's really easy to watch them because they'll kind of hang out in the same spot and then they will bob their tails up and down. So if you see a little gray bird bobbing its tail and yelling, Phoebe, Phoebe, it's probably a Phoebe. <laughs> but of course now that we're about ready to end our, our video, we start having all these other birds come in. Uh, we'll see next week what we get. We, we'll see if we get some different birds. I'm always hopeful to see what new birds we get. I know this is the first week that we've had the chipping sparrows coming commonly to the feeders. So it is very exciting to see how things are changing. Yeah. And I'm excited to share with you guys next week what new changes I've seen. And I hope that you guys share with us, too. 
please tell us what you guys are seeing in your yard. Maybe you're seeing some really cool birds. Or maybe you see a new flower that you've never seen before. Feel free to share your photos, thoughts, questions. And I think that's about all the time we have for this week. But please feel free to tune in again next week. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about some of our topics that we're going to be sharing information on. So this next week we'll be talking a lot about the four spheres, which is a really common topic that's taught a lot in fifth grade classrooms. And then we're also hoping to have a section on decomposition and to talk about, for example, what happens to those sunflower seed shells once the birds peel those shells off. So keep that in mind, and I hope you guys have a lot of time to go out and explore. This is going to be a great week to see a lot of great stuff. We're supposed to have some really sunny and warm days, but we're also supposed to have some rainy days. And rainy days are one of my favorites because you get to see all sorts of things that you wouldn't otherwise get to see. So with that, thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you guys again next week. And I just want to say goodbye to you, and all of you have fun learning about nature. Yes, enjoy. Go out and explore.